It is time for Tacky Talk. State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy is joining us for our weekly uh, podcast. How are you, Tacky? Doing not bad, Joe. Good to see you again on another week. Uh, we have a bright and sunny day, and the weather continues to play tricks with us. Boy, it's it's one extreme to the other. We go from uh, the Arctic tundra to uh, you know almost sunny Florida here. Well, I, I, what we call it, the fall springs, it's coming up. So some of you may see those uh, little moths that occasionally appear in warm weather, thinking that it's warmer than it really is. As Mother Nature is now playing of all of nature. And uh, I don't know some of you, but I've been hearing the Canadian geese come back a bit early, which I'm a little surprised by, to be honest with you. Out in the marsh in front of my house, uh, hanging out. And I'm like, aren't you guys like a month early? Oh, maybe a harbinger of, of good things to come, let's hope. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, Canadian geese are not one of my favorite birds. I think most have experienced that. You know why. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's been strange, uh, needless to say. But, you know, we're still here. We're still kicking and uh, happy to have another conversation with you in a new week in February. Yeah. Likewise. And uh, there have been some changes, certainly over the past week. I guess one of the biggest ones is we have a date for the opening of the state house. Yeah, the uh, House and Senate have agreed to uh, open the state house to the public on February 22nd, uh, which is the day after uh, President's Day next week. Um, the State House has been closed to the public, sort of. I think there's been not the greatest communication on this because if it was close to the State House completely, nobody, none of the reporting or press conferences would have been able to happen in the State House, right? I mean, so what we've been doing over the past uh, almost two years now is that uh, staff and legislators are allowed to enter the State House. There is contact tracing because you have to alert people that you showed up just in case. Uh, we have had multiple situations of people infected since April 2020 come into the state house uh, and caused obviously enormous contact tracing among the staff and uh, janitorial crew and support staff administrators, IT people, and so forth. So, you know, obviously there are people working in the state house, and whenever someone becomes infected or does infection walk into the place, you know, massive contact tracing occurs. Um, you can come to the state house uh, with appointment. We have allowed that in the past, uh, prior to uh, the coming Tuesday. So, if you really needed to visit someone, arrangements can be made uh, through security to allow you through. So, what is different now is that now you can come into the building uh, in the public without a prior appointment. And to do so, you need to demonstrate that you have a vaccination card status, and you uh, or you can have to, um, let's see, vaccination card or you do a uh, COVID test 24 hours prior to arrival. So the security will still be operated by the uh, DCR Rangers. And I've been informed uh, that the House and Senate court officers will be screening people coming into the State House as additional security. And there's obviously heightened uh, security with the state police given the security breach uh, last week. So it's been two things going on once. Once we're, uh, one was setting a process for people to be screened. Uh, for their vaccinations. And secondly, we have now heightened security uh, because of that security breach. So, um, you know, we'll see how it works for folks. But I always remind people that once you enter the state house, you can hang out all day. Think of it as, think of it as being in the Boston Common, but indoors. And uh, that's, that's the difference between this and every public building in, in the Commonwealth. No building in the Commonwealth lets you sit in the reception area all afternoon. Uh, we also have a library. The state house library is very popular with the public, people come in and read books and use the periodicals and access uh, our computer systems on archives, uh, very popular. And then people would like to just wander the halls, pop in and out of offices. Uh, the only exceptions is public hearings. When a public hearing ends, we generally will lock the doors to the hearing rooms and, you know, the public leaves the hearing room. But it doesn't mean you can't you know, hang out in Great Hall for the rest of the day. You can hang out at the cafeteria upstairs the rest of the day. I've seen it happen before. You know, and, um, you know, this is kind of the difference that, you know, no public building does. I mean, it's like City Hall in Quincy. You can't sit in the mayor's office all day long. You can't sit at DPW all day long. You know, people tend to forget that about the state house because, you know, I, I, I do recognize the so-called frequent flyers, right? They're always there all the time. Yeah. Do you know the particulars, Tacky, of like what will be considered fully vaccinated? And, and as far as the test, can it be a home test? Does it have to be a PCR test? <sighs> Welcome to a little bit of vagueness going on and instructions being given. OK. Uh, demonstration of vac full vaccination is, uh, again, two dose vaccination is still uh, perceived as the full vaccination out there. 
the uh, testing is a big question mark because the PCR test takes up to two days right. minimum right. to get a return. Rapid test, of course, you can generate in a short time, but you don't get the same type of documentation. Um, I'll be honest with you, we're a little vague on this one. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little vague on this, uh, on how that would work. Uh, I think uh, what we we'll do is definitely encourage folks to get their vaccination cards. We know the state is 77% and climbing on two dose vaccination, we're well into 95%, one dose vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, accommodations would be, have to be made for children at five and below, right. given the current uh, vaccination status issue. Um, I do believe that we'll be reasonable about, you know, children uh, five and below. Uh, and realistically speaking, uh, there won't be any school tours at a state house to at least, you know, the summertime. So, you know, it's not like kids are going to the state house right now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, should be, you should be in school, I hope. Right. Well, uh, school vacation week next week, but yeah, generally. Yeah. Generally, yes. I, hopefully the kids are in school. And uh, school tours, like I said, are generally in the summertime. So starting like in late May to to July, we, we get a lot of the kids coming in for tours. Uh, but the other real question is whether or not we hold events back in the state house. That is an unanswered question because okay. people utilize Great Hall, Nurses Hall, um, but the Grand Staircase for public events where you crowd you know, hundreds of people you know, shoulder to shoulder uh, for various types of rallies or uh, advocacy days or public awareness days or uh, education briefings for legislators and staff. Um, celebrations for historical moments. Um, so I'm I'm not clear if we're going to do that yet um, because I've had inquiries about when that would be having public events uh, and reserve rooms for that. And I'm I'm don't think we're going to do that just yet. Okay, all right. And and regardless, uh, masks will be required for everyone, right? Yeah, masks are required for everyone. Um, to my knowledge, because I've been in the office a bit more uh, doing this. You know, March, uh, boy, not March. Uh, well, let me see here. I've been, I was in State House in December, uh, January, and you know, February, on and off uh, to get my mail and uh, look at the offices to put some screens up, uh, those plastic barriers for the reception area up front. Uh, but again, people don't ignore the reception area with no one's there and just walk into my office. Yeah. I've had that happen more than once in my life now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is appear to be no screens around my staff's desk at the moment. <laughs> Um, in case people in public walk on in. Okay, yeah. So it's going to be a, a, a learning process, <laughs> you know, getting getting back into it. Will, will all the legislators be back? Uh, emergency rules still do apply. We are still allowed to operate remotely for formal sessions. Uh, the staff uh, has worked out a schedule. Uh, the intention is not to have all staff be there at the same time in my situation. I do have five staffers. Uh, if uh, there is one that gets COVID, and you're sitting two feet from them all day long, uh, the odds are pretty good. Even if you're vaccinated, there's a possibility you may be an asymptomatic carrier minimal. So um, we have uh, decided to operate on a rotating staff basis, and we are required to do our own contact tracing in each office. So if uh, you want to make an appointment visit me or you randomly walk in, uh, you need to fill out a contact tracing form. Which is what, simply what, name, address, phone number? Yep. Basically, we got to find you in case, you know, we find out that one of us got something and you're with us long enough that you have a probability of getting infected. Like I said, it doesn't matter your vaccination status. We will want to alert you in the case of a, of a situation. And uh, if uh, somehow, uh, God forbid, uh, you know, my staff gets infected, we're in quarantine mode. Mm -hmm. we will, I will close my office and we'll go to quarantine and re remain remote. I mean, if you all think that I'm going to be stupid enough to allow infected people sitting around waiting to infect you. I mean, no. I mean, I hope you all think I have at least some common sense not to do that to everybody. Right. It's yeah. It's all about protecting each other, you know, as well as ourselves. And it's it, it has been, you know, throughout the life of this pandemic. Oh no, I'm aware, and you probably heard stories of folks in this city running around fully infected and proceeded to just hang out with folks, not telling them what's going on. I've heard it happen in doctor's offices already, mm -hmm. uh, other medical people. I've heard that happen in uh, restaurants and bars uh, throughout uh, the reopening process. And uh, people find out after the fact that this person was infected, hanging around drinking next to them for the last you know, three hours. Uh, you can imagine the unpleasantness that happens regarding the contact tracing and further infections in the room. Uh, not everyone's fully responsible. They're under some impression that, no, oh, it's, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. Right. And that's the reason for mandates in the, in the first place. Yeah. And I've had a few friends I was supposed to catch up with on business 
Uh, we were going to meet someplace outside in Quincy and have a, a cup of tea, depending on the weather circumstances, and, and catch up on work issues. And you know, this is how I've been operating. You know, whether in this format or you know, six feet away from me outdoor someplace. I've had mm-hmm. meetings in my own yard for Pete's sakes. I mean, business continued at the, the state house despite the situation at the uh, state house axis. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a thing that's underappreciated by the media. Uh, I think my constituency and the public does have some appreciation of the work my office put in. I don't think the media has appreciation because they didn't have to let the media into the state house. They could have had uh, press conferences any number of other places. Um, so, you know, obviously there was a mechanism for the state house reporters to be there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Do you think um, the protest last week has anything to do with this policy change? No, we received a notification at the beginning of January that we're going to move to a phased opening. Okay. Uh, so we already been alerted that we had to submit to human resources some type of staffing, um, what do you call it, staffing schedule. Mm-hmm. So my chief of staff and me, we had a chat and then, you know, we talked to the other staff and, you know, obviously we know everybody's family statuses and what's going at home with them. So we could try to figure out, you know, how to reduce exposure as much as possible while everyone is at the back of the office and the, the back of the office some level. The idea is that we will um, see how this goes. And as we progress forward, we'll adjust um, how we just keep adjusting. Right. Yeah. But pivoting, we, as they say, right? <laughs> and they're actually pivoting. And like I say, if there's an infection and there's more than one person off at the same time during that scheduling day, you know, you're going to quarantine. Mm-hmm. Yep. The indicators are, are are good. I just looked at the wastewater data this morning, actually, and it is at its lowest point almost since last summer. So um, that's a that's a great indicator. It has been pretty much throughout the pandemic. Yeah, it, it's again, the disease here is it's got to continue to have a chain of infection. Once it runs out of chain of infection to get, whether it be from vaccination or just keeping away from people, it, it will start to go down. Last time we had a massive drop off was because of vaccinations. It really did stop the spread. And then Delta, frankly, was on the decline. And then we had Omicron make an appearance right. you know, as it was in its decline, because again, we ran out of people to infect as we continue vaccinations and, and uh, quarantine ourselves if you happen to be infected. Um, but this year has been unusually different for Omicron because according to ABC News, I watched last night, children had been four times more infected uh, five below unvaccinated than Delta. And uh, the myth uh, is now truly a myth about young children having greater resistance level and less likely of infections of COVID-19, which seemed to be true on COVID original version. Yes. COVID alpha seemed to be that true. Uh, Delta seemed to break that myth, but Omicron most definitely has broken the myth that children have a naturally higher resistance. That is not true now. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, <laughs> viruses don't know borders either. I know that uh, South Korea is struggling right now with a surge. Other parts of the world are still struggling with Omicron surge. So it's it's going to be a global vaccination, um, you know, effort before, before it's endemic, I think. Agreed. And again, I remind folks that not all people have the same resource that we have in the U.S. You know, we have a high choice of vaccination. We manufacture a lot. We have more distribution capacity, whether it be in-person brick and mortar or mobile ability in rural parts of the U.S., uh, you know, we can get the vaccine to you some way, somehow. I mean, we, we are the most advanced country. Now, whether people choose to take advantage of the ability of our largeness and technological advancements and wealth is not my call. It's your call on how you want to, you know, take advantage of that. But I mean, you know, you cannot say at all that the United States does not have the, the financial technological know-how to get you vaccinated. We will get you vaccinated. Right. Other countries cannot boast this, nor do they have the the purchasing power nor the infrastructure capacity to manage it. So uh, I know that, you know, early on we had a, you know, didn't have a lot <laughs> going in in 2021 where we started vaccinations because of supply uh, chain issues and you got to get it ramped up and everyone's getting themselves uh, prepared for um, massive vaccinations. But now that we've been in this process for a full year, uh, it does run fairly smoothly overall. Uh, and, uh, you know, accommodations are, are made regardless. Now, you know, I know when there's a mass, it's like a Christmas rush, right? When a lot of people come at the same mm-hmm. time, but it's it's not from the lacks of, of uh, vaccine. Uh, and uh, we do have the capacity to do that. So, you know, I again, again, say over and over again, I know we're very fortunate and blessed to live in this country uh, by far none. And COVID has definitely proven that to me. And, 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 you know, cost is not an inhibitive factor at all anywhere in the United States. It's, that's incredible. 
That is incredible. Not all countries have the capacity to do that. They're heavily related on donations from uh, rich first world countries, including ourselves. And even in countries that could uh, buy vaccine because they're uh, you know, a top 10 economy, are had trouble accessing supply chain. Again, Canada is a top 10 modernized country, had a long wait to get their access to vaccine because countries like ours in the EU you know, were able to gobble them up sooner than they could. Uh, South Korea had a wait. Remember, they had to get a donation from Poland. I mean, mm-hmm. really. Uh, you know, Australia had a long wait. Uh, but now there is a surge out everywhere as Omicron waves move through. And I've been checking in Hong Kong, and if they can't contain the surge, I mean, they're looking at 20,000 person infections a day. It's uh, an island that is smaller than Greater Boston. Well, not small, but about the same size as the Greater Boston area. You know, Boston plus the verbs uh, on the regional train, uh, on the regional um, map, uh, transportation map. There's a thing called Greater Boston. Yep. And uh, it's about 7.2 million people. So it's you know, slightly bigger than Massachusetts. So, you know, right now they've moved to draconian level lockdowns uh, and they've emptied the public hospitals. If you do not have uh, a need to be overnight in the hospital, you are basically, basically told to go home now. Wow. They, they're preparing, they're preparing, and they also uh, have set up a, a, a dorm a infection quarantine dorm. And the island is now uh, trying to recruit hotels because obviously nobody's visiting the island. <laughs> Uh, recruit all the hotels be quarantine centers as well. So, you know, the, the island is in serious, serious problems here. And they do have a good vaccination rate, but they do have the Chinese vaccine, which is proven to be not as near as effective in stopping the spread. Yeah. So, you know, on top of the Moderna, the J&J, and the Azotesica, and, and the Pfizer, they have everything over there. But, you know, not all vaccines were discovered to create equal. And, you know, they're moving to draconian lockdowns. I mean, they, they shot down the bars, the nightclubs, you know, all the saunas, uh, all the um, shopping plazas that have limited capacity, uh, the closing larger restaurants and smaller restaurants. I mean, they, they're, they're moving into it. And they'll lock down whole apartment complexes and require mandatory testing uh, as soon as they find one infection. So, um, yeah, they're, across, they're going to cross the 20,000 person day barrier uh, probably at the end of the month. And you, know, you think about the spray with 20,000 a day, you got 7.5 or 5 million people in a very small contained space. It's going to move like wildfire. Yeah. So it's not over yet for some people, for sure. That's no no question. Can we switch gears a little bit, Tacky? You you mentioned uh, transportation. I know you were uh, were at the groundbreaking earlier this week, the new MBTA bus maintenance facility here in Quincy. Yeah, this is very exciting for all of us. We've been having public meetings in this matter since pre-COVID, actually. (laughs) I remember the first meeting we had at the Southwest uh, Middle School Mm -hmm. uh, on this issue of the MBTA. And the those of you know on Hancock Street, you know, been staring at that same maintenance garage since I was a child. Uh, and I'm sure that it's much, much older than I am. No, it's uh, over 100 years old, actually. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's your fra- geographic location is against the marsh, that it's not desirable uh, over the course of a century. Uh, it cannot accommodate the large uh, buses uh, of the modern era. It still uses old diesel buses that are outlived their lifespan by 20 odd years. Um, and obviously, people have driven down Hancock Street, getting in and out with buses is unpleasant as a as a driver, as they kind of pop out and you got to do the you know the, the adjustment as to try to get in and out of that location. And if someone parks the car illegally in one of the corners near the bus depot, it becomes like a, an interesting three point turn situation, holding up the rest of us in traffic. And uh, obviously, if you're near that, uh, live near the area, you got the diesel fumes coming out. So. Yeah. Um, you know, for for residents in that geographical location, this is this is great. You know, the old Lowe's location, obviously, they have the fence barrier up, um, and uh, the residents have been living with um, a degree of traffic associated with that. In some ways, this would be less difficult because you don't have that constant stream of traffic moving through. Mm-hmm. Um, they go. It is going to be a garage. It would be inside a contained building, um, and uh, hope uh, is that in the near near future. And we're able to get electric buses, which means that you would not have diesel buses. The noise level will be significantly lower with electric buses. Um, and then we can uh, have a more green uh, public transit system in uh, Quincy and the surrounding area. Quincy is a hub bus area. I think people sometimes forget that. It services places like Randolph, Wayworth, and Braintree. Mm-hmm. It does go into places like Mattapan. So, I mean, we're a hub. We are a hub area. So this is actually very exciting uh, to uh, put this together. Um, uh, on this new bus garage. Uh, I remember uh, my old days working for Morrissey when they started putting hybrid buses out. We couldn't get in in Quincy because simply they couldn't fit in the garage. Oh, okay. That literally was the reason. 
And there was a lot of disappointment because, you know, me among many other people were like, oh, we can get rid of these old diesel, black, smoky, spewing things for these, these hybrids, which, you know, it's, you know, back then, 20 years ago, that was you know, a step in the right direction. Yep. Um, and uh, we couldn't get those. So here we are, thanks to the, as, as Senator Warren said, the, the federal dollars, otherwise it probably wouldn't happen. Yeah, we are very excited. Massachusetts getting $9.5 billion in federal transportation money. The state has to match uh, that money, uh, whether it be about 10 or 20% to access those funds, which is not a bad split, folks, when you think about it. So we're going to offer a lot of money, though. <laughs> there's a lot of money, but we'll offer a transportation bond bill, you know, of probably like a billion two, a billion two, no, billion eight. Yeah, eh, probably two billion in the end. Um <laughs> to uh, basically do the match. So you got like, you know, 9.5 billion, you know, times, you know, times to, you know, take off a decimal point. So, you know, it'll, it'll, you know we'll, we'll be able to do that. So right now it's about uh, 1.2 for environmental uh, infrastructure, which actually is very important. Obviously, Quincy will be advocating again for dredge money uh, mm-hmm. in the transportation component. Uh, you know, it is about 2.2-ish billion or so for uh, public transit and the remainder is well over $5 billion of road and bridge money. Uh, this this will greatly accelerate uh, a lot of the existing projects and uh, help break ground on projects that have been sitting in the planning phase and all permitted and ready to go. And we have about about five or so years to utilize the distribution. So this also helped the economy locally. Uh, infrastructure projects always help the economy. It has a massive ripple effect. Um, and I know unemployment rate is under 4% in Massachusetts. I haven't seen the January numbers yet, but in December it was under 4%. So uh, the economy is running strong uh, despite inflation, <laughs> which is torturing all of us, I know. Uh, but there'll be jobs, there'll be jobs, and uh, there'll be a spill-off effect associated with, with these construction projects. Yeah, restaurants will benefit. Um, you know, mom and pop stores, I'm sure, will benefit. Um, as you say, construction workers. And, you know, who knows what other cottage industries might pop up around it. No, absolutely. And uh, given the fact hospitality is still... On recovery, it's recovered immensely compared. I mean, then again, everything recovered immensely compared to 2020, uh, spring and, and summer. Uh, but we still need uh, to continue this. And, um, you know, it also fends off a future recession. One of the reasons that we managed some recession as well was actually the Big Dig project. Mm. Continuation of a massive government funded project, you know, helped starve off a major recession. Yeah. So, as I uh, kind of like alluded to, you know, in the past, you know, 2020 was prime for a recessionary period, if not for the fact COVID hit. So the economic cycle is now completely a mess mm-hmm. um, in, in terms of how we expect things. You know, recessions occur 10 to 12 years on average. Yeah. So now with this infrastructure money, we're going to be able to kind of push that out unless something, I don't know what will happen. But construction has been proven to one of those things that have been going on throughout COVID period, regardless of the lockdown. That's true. Yep. We talk a little bit about um, an issue that I know comes out of the purview of your committee regarding the uh, the gyms, the memberships. I know the AG's office just announced a settlement with Boston Sports Club, and I know you've got some legislation surrounding that to prevent any kind of issues from happening again. Yeah, some may have been victimized by the Boston Sports Club when they uh, first shut down occurred. It was still collecting your membership dues automatically, regardless of the fact they were open or not. They subsequently filed for bankruptcy uh, later on in the year. And uh, there was a huge issue about the fact they continued to kind of keep taking your money despite all that. AG intervened and proceeded to basically class action suit them on behalf of consumers under Chapter 93G, I think is the AG's power on, on consumer protection. I'm trying to remember the letter. Uh, but regardless, you know, they, she initiated her powers and worked out a settlement. Meanwhile, we've been working with the AG's office on a gym membership a bill uh, to be, give more clarity regarding uh, cancellation. Uh, how to cancel, uh, methods of cancellation, uh, consequence for not uh, complying of uh, customers' requests on cancellation, notification of rights uh, of customers uh, utilizing gym services, um, and of course, you know, you know, making sure the AGs have full authority, uh, even more so to intervene regarding mistreatment of customers by uh, gyms. So, you know, we've um, greatly expanded commu- the requirement for consumer awareness and also put limitations on how they can take your money and even expanded the refund period. I mean, you know, I know there's like one month three free trials and stuff with some gyms, but not every gym does that. Smaller gyms will, you know, give you like a two day trial. You know, we extend that to, to a week plus. Uh, 
Okay. So that gives people at least more of a chance because they're not going to the gym every day. I mean, right. most folks, you know, do alternation. I'm a big believer of workout one day, rest one day, workout next day. So you may find the gym uncomfortable, don't want to use it. You want to be able to have cancellation, but there's an inconsistent policy uh, throughout the system on cancellation, which we're going to make consist- more consistent um, by giving people more time. Uh, originally, it's like a two-day period. We're going to try to, we, we definitely expand that. And of course, we, we don't prohibit um, one month uh, trials. I mean, you can, gyms can still do that. Uh, and uh, one curious one is things like disability. If you're severely injured and able to utilize the gym, we, we make that available as a reason to not continue to using the gym. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Good, good to know. Okay. Yeah. Just because you're physically unable to use the gym, does that void the contract? Okay. Very good. That's good to know. I, I hadn't heard that provision and that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. And also death. I mean, you got to stop charging people when you're dead. <laughs> You know, so, uh, you know, these are very, we perceive as very common sense issues uh, on this. Uh, I suspect some of the other members, once we make it through the process and hopefully get to the floor, I mean, I'm sure other members will follow amendments of ideas. As always, you know, as chair of a committee, I'll entertain anybody's idea and it seems to have merit, you know, obviously I'll adopt the idea Mm -hmm. uh, and never close to that. But, you know, right now, um, you know, we've expressed an interest to the speaker's office saying, hey, you know, Mr. Speaker, this is a great consumer issue. It, it is a legit issue, um, but COVID has definitely uh, revealed a lot of the practices that actually some of us never really knew about. That's right. Yeah, so uh, some good has come out of it, I guess, uh, at least greater awareness for sure. Anything else you're excited about this session, Tacky? Uh, well, we're, you know, you know, my budget meeting's in about three weeks, so, you know, we're getting to that stage, and I'll be honest with you too. I mean, I haven't exactly seen where all my bills have uh, popped out of committee or not popped out of committee yet. It's it's one of those funny things where um, you know all of us are still using the same computer system to get the updates. So it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I kind of know, but I still have to chase the information like everybody else does. And it's 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 it's, it's a little more complicated than it sounds when you got like four thousand plus bills popping out in the same same day. I'm sure. Yeah. And you only have, like you said, five staff members to help you. So it's going to take a while. Yeah. It's going to take a while because people are calling us trying to sort out what happened in their bills too. So it's, it's, it's a little more involved people. If you want like some strange idea that the computer system sends us notifications, I mean, we, we're, we're not that sophisticated. Yeah, there's no magic. <laughs> there's, there's no, we don't have that sophisticated computer system. I'm sorry to tell you. It's not like, oh, oh you know, here's an email notice telling what happened. No, and, and we have to still chase that information out ourselves. So you know, between doing that, constituent services, you know, prime and next of committee bills, uh, you know, try to prepare for next of public hearings because I do get bills filed after the drug lieutenant's late files. You know, we're trying to work out that schedule. Um, and we're still processing some bills that we need more time on, particularly people's home petitions on, on, um, on that stuff. But, you know, we're very excited that T-bond, transportation bond's coming. There's an economic development bond. There's a capital bond bill. I know it's all money stuff, but it's the second half of a two-year cycle. We got to get this done before July 31st. Um, and then I'm not sure what else is coming out of the pike. Oh, no more as we kind of move through caucuses to see, uh, the speaker's mm-hmm. prioritization. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm excited for any particular issues coming up. Uh, it's it's now up to um, scheduling. Okay. Yeah. Right. Time is of the essence for sure. Um, the race for governor is uh, changing again. Another uh, candidate has uh, stopped her, her campaign. Danielle Allen is pulled out. Not surprised. I mean, I, I talked to Danielle Allen a couple of times. Very pleasant. Had very good conversations, but a very new person to come into politics. And uh, she, you know, did remarkably well we made, we're raising money. Uh, the problem is that she has challenges raising more mm-hmm. because, of course, everyone tends to lean towards the front runner uh, on uh, fundraising. And she's still relatively political known. Uh, and, uh, you know, trying to campaign during COVID period is tough, as we've seen in caucuses. Uh, in Quincy, we stood it virtually, uh, you know, doing videos and saying hellos. And, some point the, the math is on the wall that you you know what your budget for a campaign look like and your outreach and your ability to get delegates to vote for you at the convention to get you on the ballot is looking pretty poor. So that leaves just Sonia Chen Diaz, you know, the senator from Jamaica Plain, uh, still out there, but she is grossly underfunded compared to Amora Healy. And you can, well, you can see me do this a few times. I keep calling Mora Martha from last time out because. M's, M's mess me up, folks. <laughs> um, so don't be surprised they start doing that every so often. But more Healy, um, you know, clear fundraiser, has the infrastructure already in place statewide um, and, uh, you know, has the final capacity. And uh, this may be the first time in a very long time we're going to have a non-contested 
uh, Democratic primary in a situation where there's an open seat. We've seen a minimal contest primaries against incumbent Republican governors. Uh, Roosevelt comes to mind, Gonzalez last time, but in the uh, open uh, seat situation, it's generally like, like for a blood sport in the Democratic primary. Yeah, yeah. We may be avoiding that this time, which wow. is very remarkable in Massachusetts. Very yeah. remarkable. Yeah, it is indeed. Speaking of the primary, I know that the supplemental budget the governor signed includes uh, September 6th, officially, now is the primary election date. Yeah, if you're a Democrat or unenrolled, you can vote for a Democratic primary. If you're a Republican or unenrolled, you can vote for a Republican primary uh, come up in September. Uh, early voting and all that fun stuff, uh, you know, we're working on uh, in the budget regarding mailing vote. I mean, not budget, on other bill regarding mailing voting or not. You keep asking about that. I don't know what's going on. But we already have existing law regarding things like early voting and things like that. That's already in the books anyway. So, uh, you know, the city and town clerks all know how this process works. It's been running smoothly for several years now, and I suspect it runs smoothly again. So the other details about mail-in voting and changing date of registration and things like that, still in conference committee, but uh, all the stuff you all have been doing prior to COVID, still in the books. So, you know, like I said, the same town clerks have done a wonderful job on mass strength, what we have now. And uh, they've done a good job of mail-in voting for two years now. And I do expect we'll have mail-in voting in some form. And uh, the, you know, city town clerks are ready to go. So, yeah, um, nomination papers came out uh, on Monday the 14th, Valentine's Day. And, you know, people are able to uh, get off the get off and start running campaigns. Uh, we actually have another departure coming up. Uh, Joe Wagner, the second leader from Chicopee, has decided not to run for re-election. He's been in the legislature over 30 years. Wow. Uh, that is another departure of someone that has enormous wisdom and skill and intelligence uh, about public policy on a very wide range of issues, as well as a member of uh, the speaker's leadership team that provides a steady hand of operating the state house. Uh, so uh, he, he's not running for re-election for uh, next year, so he's going to be around. But, I mean, we've already had Claire Cloney, majority leader, leave. Uh, she had a very rapid rise to majority leader uh, inside of 10 years. Um, you know, we lost uh, you know, a chair in um, Glory Ehrlich. Uh, she is the uh, new FEMA regional director. Mm. She took the job uh, this month, as well as um, Carolyn Dykema, who runs Natural Resources and Agriculture. She has now uh, moved on to a solar company. Um, so, and uh, Linda DeCambo has announced she's not running for re-election in next cycle. She'll be around to the end of the year, and she uh, oversees the uh, Cybersecurity Committee, um, and we're not done yet. There'll be other people looking for uh, run for offices. The, my classmate Paul Mark is running for state senate. The new elected kid from uh, Ludlow, uh, Jake Oliveira, has pulled the trigger for state senate uh, in the open seat out there. Um, you know, uh, Nika Aguardo is announced for Sonia Chandia's seat in Jamaica Plain. Same thing with Liz Miranda. Um, so. You know, folks, you know, there'll be more coming. Uh, Tim Whalen, a uh, Republican from down in the Cape area, is running for sheriff. Uh, what else? Uh, Brad, uh, Brad Hillary left us for the Gaming Commission. Uh, it looks like we're losing Sheila Harrington from Broughton. She looks like she's going to be um, appointed to a court position. Uh, that We're just waiting for that formal announcement to happen on, on pushing the name forward to Governor's Council. So, you know, change is in the air and sh- there'll be more change coming. But not here in Quincy, the delegation, uh, including yourself, is, is back on the ballot. Yes, I'll be working, getting my signatures. The speaker is definitely running again, folks. He made that announcement back in the fall. Uh, and uh, for the benefit of our city, we would like to keep the speaker around uh, as long as possible. And our good colleague, Bruce Ayers, uh, has uh, also run for election in John Keenan. I am still the junior member of this group, believe it or not, uh, somehow. You young uh, whippersnapper, you. <laughs> I, I am the kid still in the delegation, uh, despite being here for uh, 11 years at this point. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, and to my knowledge, all my colleagues in the surrounding area, Mark Cusack got elected for me. He's run for election as well as Jamie Murphy from Weymouth. Uh, Bill Driscoll is a relative newcomer. He chairs the, uh, chairs the um, COVID-19 committee and Cusack uh, chairs revenue and Jamie Murphy uh, chairs financial services. And Bruce Sears is the vice chair of financial services. So, mm-hmm. Again, uh, it is in our best interest regionally to keep leadership people around uh, with the speaker. It only benefits the constituents. Sure. Uh, a little short on time today, Tacky, but I did want to mention the uh, Quincy Asian Resources uh, virtual Lunar New Year celebration coming up on Sunday, February the 20th. I know you'll be uh, uh, providing a message there. Can you give us a little preview? Not much. Uh, it's 
it seems like I'm doing a lot of these videos. Just wishing everyone a happy year of the tiger. And obviously, you know, we can hope get together again at some point and enjoy the full festivities of the uh, event, you know, saying hi to folks, you know, watching the live performances and, and enjoying food and seeing uh, all the different vendors and whatnot. And also the hard work of uh, the high school kids, North and Quincy High and putting this festival together. They had to shift gears and uh, made care packages for uh, senior housing in particular, um, you know, reminded that uh, they're not forgotten as part of the Lunar New Year. Uh, isolation is a big issue, as everyone's discovered, especially in the senior population, which are higher risk of catching COVID-19. It's a great job by Quinjay Resources and uh, the volunteers there to organize these care packages. I, I, it means a lot to folks. So even though we can't do something conventionally, you know, community service continues to be here and uh, provide um, a way for folks to remember to not be forgotten. Yeah, I want to remind folks you can watch uh, that celebration here on QA TV. Also, uh, through our social media um, and, of course, through Corey's uh, social media and website as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it'll be a repeat uh, on QATB, which uh, we're very you know, happy and thankful they do do the repeats. And it's, again, a cultural celebration they can enjoy from home. Uh, but it's still not the same being in person. And uh, as I've said in you know, other interviews on other media outlets, I mean, Chinatown is very uh, subdued. Uh, they had a lion dance on Saturday in the snow. I mean, uh, Sunday in the snow, uh, the 24-hour snowstorm did not was expected. Um, and, uh, but I mean, the ch conventional Chinese near banquets have pretty much been canceled. Uh, and uh, there's a huge financial hit from a lot of uh, not-for-profit Asian organizations, uh, particularly Chinese ones, because Lunar New Year's um, in Chinatown is obviously Chinatown Lunar New Year, right? Chinese organizations uh, you know, have taken a monster financial hit. And, the House Asian Caucus and um, the legislature you know, was able to appropriate a million dollars in Mass Cultural Council money. The applications are currently open for uh, Asian uh, performance cultural groups uh, who have uh, been impacted by COVID because of the inability to do these cultural events as part of the making money. Part of um, celebrating opening of businesses actually involves a lion dance and performers. A lot of businesses do it as part of good luck and, and warding off bad spirits is, you know, pursuing to tradition. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a um, Asian uh, performance group that's listening right now, please do visit the Mass Culture Council website you know, to find out if you qualify to apply. Uh, applications are open. They're going to close March 23rd, and uh, they're going to do disbursements uh, in, the, in the April month. And uh, we would like to, you know, get this money out to folks before, before the close of the fiscal cycle. Okay, good to know. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll get that website up on the screen for folks to see. Um, speaking of, how do they get a hold of you, Tacky? Same old, same old. 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014. You know, if you can't get anybody, hit a button. You know, we'll have skeletal staff starting next week. Uh, uh, if there is a lot of phone calls, obviously, it's going to go to voicemail because you can't be answering the phone twice in one time. Uh, <laughs> some degrees of common sense on that front. You can email me at tacky.chan at amyhouse.juv, tacky.chan at amyhouse.juv. I do read all your emails, believe it or not. Uh, we do prioritize constituent service calls over all calls that come to my office. Uh, so all of you be aware that we prioritize constituent services first at all times. But people's testimonies and opinions regarding public policy, I do hear them. So uh, I'm aware of it. And of course, Tacky Chan uh, Facebook page, Representative Tacky, State Representative Tacky Chan Facebook page. We do post some useful information as well as my Twitter account at Tacky Chan. And of course, Tacky Chan org is slowly but steadily being updated by the staff. So um, you know we'll have that out there. So plenty of resources without talking to me. You can try to find stuff. Uh, but if you uh, feel the need to drop me a note, I will read it. That is most definite. But again, folks, I do prioritize uh, constituent services first. Okay, good to know. Maybe next time we uh, Zoom, it'll be from your statehouse office. Oh, yes. Uh, so the uh, Let's see how the wireless internet goes in the statehouse. <laughs> 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 we're, we're a brick, concrete, granite, steel, mishmash building. I think... Uh, Wi-Fi in the state house is an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> Maybe back in your car in the parking lot. Then. <laughs> that, that may actually be happening. I might get a better 5G signal than the state house signal. Um, actually, that is an interesting thing, too, because we use wired LANs through the whole building. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to convert everything to docking stations and land up from there as opposed to putting stress in a Wi-Fi. 
Yeah. Um, so that's part of our, our technology change and people are like, oh, what took you so long? Well, have you guys seen the supply chain and technology? It's, yeah, we have, this, we have a procurement process and everything else, just like state government and other businesses. So um, we have the same problem mm-hmm. on, on upgrades. So we, we fully anticipate more hiccups as we go along regarding technology as we um, move through um, the gradual reopening. All right. Good to talk to you as always. Appreciate it, Techie. You know, take care and I'll see you maybe in two weeks. I'm supposed to take next week off. We'll see how successful I really am because every time I say that, I end up working anyway. Okay. Hopefully I haven't jinxed you. (laughs) (laughs) And if I don't, have a wonderful time off and uh, we'll catch up uh, soon. We definitely will. See you then. 